Hello, friends. Thank you so much for watching this recording of our weekly Bible study at St. Timothy. I want to first ask you to please like this video, subscribe. If you're not subscribed to our channel already, please do that so you can get a notification every time that we have a new video or new content available for you. And if you have any questions or reflections throughout the course of this study, please leave those in the comments below for others to see and so that your questions get answered. It's so wonderful to have you join us in this way, but would love to invite you and have you join us in person on Monday nights, every Monday at 7.30 in the Parish Hall at St. Timothy Catholic Church in Laguna Niguel. If you can't join us in person, that's fine, but we would love for you to come. All backgrounds, all levels of faith experience and experience with the Bible are welcome. So we do hope to see you there. And without further ado, enjoy this recording of our weekly Bible study at St. Timothy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the opportunity to be together in this way, digitally, to dive into your word and to allow you to speak to us. And so I pray, Lord, for whenever and however uh, those who are watching this receive these words, that you would be with them, that your Holy Spirit would fill them, guide them, and speak to them specifically the words that you have in store for them. We pray, Lord, that as we dive into Scripture, our worries, distractions, anxieties would melt away, and that we would lay this time intentionally at your feet so that your will would be done. Speak to us. We are your servants and we are listening. Send us, challenge us, convict us in the ways that we need so that we can fulfill the mission that you've called each one of us to. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to Bible study. This week we are studying the uh, Gospel of Matthew, specifically Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 36, reading through chapter 10, verse 8. And the Gospel of Matthew is the Gospel for cycle A. We're finally returning to the Gospel of Matthew. And in this passage, we are going from a particular discourse in Matthew, um, a second section, uh, into the third section, which is called the Missionary Discourse. And the missionary discourse is primarily where Jesus sends out the apostles to go perform whatever mission that he had in store for them. And so we have the introductory part of the, uh, of the Gospel of Matthew. The Sermon on the Mount makes up most of the second part and the ministry and healing surrounding that. And then this is the beginning or kind of the hinge between one uh, section and another. So, and finally, returning to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, let's be reminded of a few things that are prominent in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, the kingdom of heaven and Old Testament imagery, specifically things like the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel being the chosen people of God through whom he is going to redeem the entire world. Seeing Jesus as a new Moses, uh, a lot of Moses imagery, things that happened back in Numbers and Exodus are evoked in new ways in the person of Jesus. Uh, and also revealing Jesus as a new king in the line of King David. These are very common Matthew themes in his gospel. Uh, Old Testament imagery of the Passover sacrifice, Jesus being the new Passover lamb, are also prominent in this gospel. Um, and so in this passage, we'll have some of those similarities, uh, some of those different themes, but we have the mission of the twelve being sent out uh, two by two, um, I believe two by two, or at least being sent out um, to go and preach the good news. And so, we're beginning in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 of the Gospel of Matthew. First time through, just get a picture for what is being said and paint this uh, image in your mind. See if you notice anything new. What do these people look like? Where might they be? How is it that they are, are speaking to one another? What does it look like for them to fulfill this mission? At the sight of the crowds, Jesus' heart was moved with pity for them, because they were troubled and abandoned, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Then he summoned the twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure every disease and every illness. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, 
Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Jesus sent out these twelve after instructing them thus, Do not go into pagan territory or enter a Samaritan town. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, make this proclamation. The kingdom of God is at hand. Cure the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse lepers. Drive out demons. Without cost you have received, without cost you are to give. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So now we're going to read this passage a second time. Now that you get an image for what is being shared here, Jesus sending the apostles out to do this ministry. Uh, Now we are going to read this a second time. Listen particularly for any word, phrase, or detail that resonates with you. Maybe there's something that strikes you and what's going on in your life sparks a memory. It just stands off, off the page, jumps out at you for some reason. It doesn't have to have anything to do with interpreting the passage, but pay attention to those things and just reflect on them. Why is this standing out? What might the Lord be calling my attention to or trying to compel me to do? What is he saying to me? Second and final time through Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 36. At the sight of the crowds... Jesus' heart was moved with pity for them, because they were troubled and abandoned, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Then he summoned his twelve apostles and gave them authority over unclean spirits, to drive them out and to cure every disease and every illness. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Jesus sent out these twelve after instructing them thus, Do not go into pagan territory or enter a Samaritan town. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, make this proclamation. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, drive out demons. Without cost you have received, without cost you are to give. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to take a moment to just quietly reflect over this passage and the things that stood out to you in it. If you're sharing this or watching this with a group of people, you're welcome to pause this video or you on your own can pause and reflect, journal, uh, write some follow-up questions or reflections, make note of the things that you have questions about, and please share those things with us in the comments of this video as you like and subscribe to our channel because we want to hear your feedback. We want to hear what stands out to you, and if your your questions aren't answered, Uh, We can answer those for you in the comments or in the live chat so you can interact with one another. Uh, So please take a few moments to do that or pause, um, and then we will continue with our reflection. So in this passage, Jesus here is uh, dealing with the crowds that have amassed around him in the northern region of Galilee, specifically in and around the city of Capernaum, his adult hometown during the course of his ministry. And so these crowds have been following him. He has been uh, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel, and uh, curing every disease and illness. It says that in verse 35. So that's our context. But he sees these crowds, and his heart is moved with pity for them. That word, moved with pity, is actually better translated, moved with compassion. And this happens a few times in Scripture where this word is used. The word in Greek for compassion, in this sense, is esplankniste. And it's a very uh, difficult to pronounce Greek word, but its root word is splagkna, which means bowels. And so it's literally being moved to the depths of your bowels, where the seat of the emotions was believed to be. So when you have that kind of visceral gut emotional reaction towards something, that's what this word is meant to evoke. It's almost like like an animal cry or something very animalistic. This word is used uh, when Jesus grieves at the tomb of Lazarus in John 11. It's used in other places uh, similar to this where he's having pity or compassion on someone. But the reason he, he does is because they're troubled and abandoned. They're troubled and abandoned. Have you ever felt troubled and abandoned? Like you're lost, like no one understands, like you're all on your own. I think that's very much what the devil wants us to believe. 
because we're never alone. The Lord is always with us, always seeking for us to have and receive His grace and His compassion. And that's why His very mission, as He put it in His words in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, says that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. To seek and to save the lost. Just as the shepherd in his parable goes, leaves the 99 in search of the one sheep that has wandered off, or that a woman who has lost one coin will leave behind everything to go in search of that. When they find these things, they throw this great feast. Like the prodigal son being welcomed home despite turning away from God. All those things in Luke chapter 15, those great parables of our faith, the gospel within the gospel. All of those evoking this desire that God has to minister to us when we are troubled and abandoned. And so I just want to say to you, if you're troubled and abandoned right now watching this, know that the Lord is with you. Know that He has not forgotten you. That He sees your pain, He sees your loneliness, He sees your isolation and your worry, your concern about, well, why isn't my life look the way that I thought it would? Why haven't I done X yet? When is this going to happen? All of the ways that stress and anxiety buckle you, bend you over, cripple you. All of those things He sees and He has a plan for them. He's, he's going to bring something good and beautiful out of them. And it's difficult to know that direction because the people in this passage are similarly feeling this way because they are sheep without a shepherd. Sheep are not very smart. They, uh, they, don't, they can't really see very well in front of them. They have very good peripheral vision. So if you can lead them in a group, they can follow one another. And usually shepherds will push from behind kind of in a sense of panic. But Jesus, the good shepherd, he stands out front. He says in John 10, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. He leads us. And so if we can keep our eyes fixed on him standing very close, because our spiritual vision is not very good, brothers and sisters, we do not have the foresight and the moral ability to make the best decisions all the time. We need to trust in the shepherd. We need to trust in the shepherd. All throughout the Old Testament, you can see in the footnotes in Numbers 27, 1 Kings 22, Jeremiah 50, Ezekiel 34, and earlier in the Gospel of Mark, there's references and other places too, references to the shepherd. And the shepherd uh, who is meant to be the one guiding Israel is God. But Israel rejected God as their king, and so they sought out other leaders. And so in Exodus, Moses is asked by God to elect a leader to follow him because the sheep cannot be without a shepherd. And so that's what he does, and he appoints Joshua. Um, or is that, that might be in Numbers chapter 27. The same thing is true in 1 Kings 22. Prophecies and explanations of the people being lost, sheep without a shepherd. Prophecies in Jeremy and, uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel about the, the people of Israel being scattered because they were sheep without a shepherd. They're crying out to God because they rejected him as shepherd and they sought earthly shepherds. They sought people to follow, things to follow, things to believe in that they could control or understand. And eventually they were lost. They wandered off. They wandered away from the path that God had before them. Worry and anxiety can do that to us. When we feel like we're alone, when we don't confide in other people, when we don't seek good wisdom and counsel from others, we can often fall into a, a wrong way of thinking, follow a wrong crowd or a wrong idea, and it can lead us very, very far astray before we know it. And so it's important that we as sheep have a good shepherd. But how this passage will continue is that Jesus is also showing that he doesn't need sheep to just be sheep, that eventually sheep can become shepherds. He goes on and makes an analogy similar to this where he says, the harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. The sheep are invited to become the shepherds. The harvest is abundant. He says that in John chapter 4, after he encounters the woman at the well, and she goes off to the town, and she brings all these followers from the town back, and he tells the disciples, look, the harvest is abundant. You are going to reap what you did not sow. Look at all of this at hand. And so the harvest is abundant. Jesus has done the work, but the laborers who are going out to actually reap the harvest, to tell people that Jesus has done that work of saving them, they are few. And we're all called to do that by virtue of our baptism. So what does Jesus do? He shows, he links this, even though there's a chapter break here, it's important to keep in mind, there were no chapters and verses or no set chapter and verse method 
to delineate, um, you know, how to find things in Scripture until like the 15 or 1600s. So it was very difficult for anyone who wasn't a scholar or wasn't very learned in theology and biblical studies to read the Bible or find anything in it, because most translations maybe were in Latin. They were very rare to come by. The printing press had just been invented in 1450. It wasn't publicly accessible. You heard the word when you went to the liturgy, when you went to Mass. And so, private study, personal study wasn't really a thing, and it wasn't very organized for that until someone came up with now a pretty uniformly accepted method of separating the chapters and the verses. However, it's not perfect. So we have to remember, this was one continuous scroll, one continuous story, so there's not a break here in the action. It's just, he's talking about needing laborers for his harvest, and then what does he do? He makes some laborers. In verse 1 of chapter 10, he summoned his 12 apostles and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure every disease and every illness. Now notice here something important. I think oftentimes when we think about doing things for God and spreading the faith and being faithful to the mission that God had for us, especially living in a world that's very popularized by social media and politics and things being out in the public sphere, we think like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I got to be very vocal about it. I got to be, you know, out there teaching people in everyone's face about this. And notice what Jesus says here. He gives them authority, but it's not to teach. It's not to teach. They are meant to proclaim the kingdom. He'll say that in a few verses, but that's a very simple message. What are they mainly asked to do? They're asked to drive out unclean spirits and to cure diseases and illnesses. They're asked to reconcile people with God and to bring healing to them to help them see the light, to drive out the evil and idolatry that rests in their hearts, to help minister to them in their spiritual and physical ailments. Are we doing that as well as we seek to teach? You know, I imagine like, what would a parish look like? What would a church community look like if they took this command seriously and they had that many more ministries oriented toward curing and uh, healing people with diseases and illnesses uh, driving out demons, helping people to see the light, proclaiming the kingdom, and not just teaching. Teaching is great. We need to know our faith. But first and foremost, we need to know Jesus. And Jesus came to heal, to seek and to save the lost. Jesus did not come to inform and to educate and to lecture. Yes, he had a new teaching, but that new teaching is meant to be taking root in that place in our hearts where he has already come to minister, to love us, to welcome us out of the darkness and into his light, to bring us out of the depths of sin because he died for sin so that we might rise and live in eternal life with him. That is what he came to do. And so if your faith is very encyclopedic, very ritual-based, very going through the motions, as I am often critical of, those things are good, but they are not what we are called to do in and of themselves. They will be characteristics, maybe, of our faith, but the central core invitation of our faith is relationship with Jesus. And relationships require change, vulnerability, healing, bearing all about the things that we've done, uh, the, the places that we've been, the people that we are. When my wife and I started dating, and the more our relationship progressed, the more vulnerable we became with one another, the more of ourselves that we shared with one another, and that changed us to each other. Like, we changed in the process of being in relationship with one another. We change for the better as a result of that vulnerability. But it wasn't the beauty of the dating relationship, the beauty of that intimacy and growing in relationship with someone wasn't like, all right, let's just sit here and memorize information about each other. Like, um, oh, what's your favorite color? Oh, green. Oh man, I feel like I know you so much better now. This is so romantic and intimate. No, like the information is not where that happens. It's not like I just benefited from knowing all those vulnerabilities of my wife and her from me so I could go journal about them and create a dossier of her personality and look at it and be like, wow, yes, I have a really good personal profile of my wife now. No, it's about healing, transforming our hearts by being close to Jesus. That is what he goes to send the apostles to do. And then we have, for the very first time in the Gospel of Matthew, a list of the 12 apostles and setting them apart from the rest of the disciples. That has not yet happened in the Gospel of Matthew. So this is the first time they are set apart, and they are given a particular office and title of apostles. The word apostle comes from a Greek word, apostelin, which means to be sent forth, or one who is sent forth. And so these are the people who have that missionary zeal. They've been given the authority by God, by Jesus, because he is the one who has that authority and the power to do these things. 
He gives them that authority to go out in a missionary spirit to go and do this. And that word apostle is reserved for these 12 initially. And when Judas betrays Jesus and he dies, his replacement is elected in Acts chapter 1, and that is Matthias in Acts 1.26. So the 12 constitute a whole intentional num- number that is meant to be continued in perpetuity. Now that got lost through, the, through history and through martyrdom, and, but the offices of those apostles, they became the first bishops. And that office of bishop was passed down generation after generation. When one bishop died or when one bishop moved away, a new bishop was ordained or a new bishop was set in that particular place so that the Christian community could thrive and could have access to all of the sacraments. And so there, the 12 are an echo of the 12 tribes of Israel that have been lost, broken, divided as a result of people turning toward themselves and turning away from God. And it's meant to be a symbolic representation and restoration of the kingdom of Israel. That's why Jesus is about to say, don't go out to the Gentiles and to the pagans. It's not because he doesn't intend to. It's because he wants to reestablish what the kingdom of Israel was always pointing toward, a unified sacramental faith in the Jewish community, forming a new covenant with God through which the entire world is saved. That was his intention the entire time, choosing a people that he could journey with, that he could eventually become one of to reconcile us and to spread that message to the entire world. It says in Isaiah, even in the Old Testament, that the Jewish people are meant to be a light to all of the nations. And so this was always intended. So don't interpret this as Jesus saying this is an exclusive thing. But he has a very particular way in which he wants this to be rolled out. And he could go out to all the ends of the earth. And he does have these one-on-one encounters to people who aren't within the overall family of Israel. But he allows the church to grow out of that wellspring of the Jewish faith that God initiated through forming a covenant with people like Abraham and David and Moses, through which he wanted to redeem the entire world. And so... These are the people, the leaders, the new representatives of the 12 tribes of Israel. And these are the people in Revelation chapter 21, in the kingdom, it's the very last chapter of the Bible, in the vision of a new heaven and a new earth. What will it look like in heaven? Well, there'll be a new restored temple for us to encounter God more intimately. And on the stones of that temple will be 12 uh, kind of corner or pillar stones on which will be written, inscribed the name of each one of the 12 apostles to show that they are those who were put in the position to restore what was broken in the 12 tribes of Israel and to create a new kingdom, a new temple, a new way of encountering God. And so 12 here is very intentional. And here they are. Simon called Peter. He is always listed first in every list of the apostles because he was the chief of the apostles. Historically, he was considered the first among equals among the patriarchs, those five different seats of church authority that were first established in Rome, Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and uh, Constantinople. Uh, But he was always the first among equals. He was the one who gave direction that people were meant to follow. And so that became the office of the Pope. And we have an unbroken line of 266 validly ordained, validly elected popes with little pockets of time when there was difficulty in the church, they couldn't elect or they were still in the process of electing. But there's always been either in the process of or currently reigning a validly elected pope. There were some not validly elected anti-popes, but there was always a true pope somewhere in hiding, in a papal palace, escaping an assassination, whatever it might be. And that all harkens back to this person, Simon, called Peter, uh, who Jesus changes the name of because he gives him a particular seat of authority for the church, always listed first. Then, these next three are always listed in some order after Peter. His brother Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And then, always listed after that is Philip. And then, always listed after that is this group of three in some kind of order. Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew the tax collector. Bartholomew is sometimes called Nathaniel in other lists. And then, always listed in the following group of three in some order are James the son of Alphaeus, also known as James the Lesser, Thaddeus, also known as Jude, and Simon the Canaanian, or also known as Simon the Zealot. And then lastly, always last, is Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. These are the 12 apostles that Jesus elects. These are the laborers 
that Jesus gives authority to, to go and reap the harvest. These are the sheep that are being led, that are now being invited to become shepherds. And we read these things, and we can glean a certain, uh, a, a few things from them. First of all, this is historical. These names are about historical people, historical places that really existed, that really lived. Also, we're listed these things because we are meant to see God also inviting us. He sees us, he calls us by name, and institutes us into a particular office. That we are called to be, uh, as the first reading for this upcoming, we'll say, uh, this upcoming Sunday, we'll say in Exodus 19, that we are called to be a kingdom of priests. Now, we're not priests like Father at Mass. We're not clerical priests, ordained priests. We are what's called kingdom priests, which means we are meant to be the priests out in the world who spread the good news and bring the healing presence of Christ and his grace to others. And so, how is God calling you to be a laborer in the vineyard? What authority has he given you by virtue of your baptism and your confirmation? What unique gifts and presence of the Holy Spirit dwell in you through which you are being called to go heal and transform and evangelize? Because this is not a mission just for the priests, just for the historical apostles and bishops. This is a mission that is charged to every single baptized Christian to go out and do these things to drive out unclean spirits, to cure every disease and every illness, to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. To do these things is something that we are all charged to do. Now, these 12 apostles, uh, what happened to them? What came of these 12 people? We only hear about the fate of, I believe, two of them in the, in the Gospels. Of course, we know what happened to Judas Iscariot. He betrays Jesus. He, um, it seems like he kind of repents or regrets what he does, does. He gives the money back to the Pharisees and he goes and he hangs himself and his body is buried in uh, the field of blood or the potter's field as prophesied uh, in the Old Testament. Um, and then we also have James, uh, the son of Zebedee, He is uh, executed by Herod Agrippa in Acts chapter 12, uh, verse 2. And so he is the first of the the faithful apostles to be martyred or killed for his faith. It is believed that uh, by some that he uh, brought the faith all the way as far as Spain, which is why Santiago de Compostela, Santiago is the Spanish word for James, is associated with him, believing that he brought the faith all the way there. However, that is unlikely because Paul was the one who wanted to, to bring the faith all the way to the West, and it was clear it had not yet been done uh, for him to have this particular mission. And so that, I think, is maybe something ascribed in legend, uh, or maybe he made his way there on ship and not by land, who knows, but eventually makes his way back very early on to this region where he is executed. But going through the rest of them in order, Peter, uh, and similarly to Paul, who later is kind of becomes a self-appointed apostle along with Barnabas, Uh, on their missionary journeys because they're sent out on behalf of the church and the apostles commissioned to go spread the good news to the Gentiles. Paul, along with Peter, are executed at different times by the Emperor Nero in Rome uh, in, uh, in 66 AD or somewhere around there. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down because he did not want to be in the same position of Jesus. He thought it would be too dignified to be killed in the same way that Jesus was. So he has to be crucified upside down. Um, Andrew went to what was known at the time as the land of man-eaters, which is modern-day Russia, um, and he uh, Christians there claim that he brought the gospel to their land. So in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, Greece, um, the church, I believe, in Armenia, um, which is one of the oldest um, Catholic rites in the East, uh, was it was the first country to uh, have Christianity as their national religion in history. Uh, and that happened in like the fourth century, very early on. And so um, I think, if my memory serves me correctly, a lot of that is attributed to St. Andrew's missionary work and kind of that part of Eastern Europe, Asia Minor into Russia. Um, it is believed that he was crucified in somewhere in Turkey or in Greece, uh, or Greece, where he was crucified on an X-shaped cross. There was some miracle that happened with his remains being transported that ended up having him associated with Scotland, and that's why Scottish, the Scottish flag is an X-shaped cross. Um, so we have Peter, uh, James. John is the only one to survive martyrdom. He ends up dying of old age. He was uh, put in a boiling pot of oil, uh, persecuted, I think, in, in a Roman Colosseum or in, in uh, a place like that. But he was. Uh, it was during... Um, the persecution by the emperor Domitian during the late 90s. And then he was ex- he was exiled to the island of Patmos where he had the vision of Revelation. But 
Uh, before that, he was entrusted the care of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And because he was faithful and he was the only apostle that was there at the foot of the cross, uh, some theologians believe that is why he was able to live into this long age and to ensure that he could be able to take care of Mary until she was assumed into heaven and then continued his work that eventually led to his death of old age, uh, even though he was boiled in oil in Rome and survived. Um, James, the son of Zebedee, is the one who was beheaded. The other James, um, James, son of Alphaeus, um, it is believed that he went to Syria. It's kind of confusing because there's James, son of Zebedee, James the Lesser, also known as James, the son of Alphaeus, and then James, the brother of the Lord, who is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. So there's three different Jameses in the New Testament, if you didn't know that. Um, but it's reported that this James, son of Alphaeus, by the historian Josephus, that he was stoned and then clubbed to death for sharing the faith uh, in modern-day Syria. Uh, we continue down that list uh, after Andrew usually is Philip. Uh, Philip possibly had uh, ministry in Northern Africa and in Asia Minor, um, where he converted the wife of a, a Roman official. And that Roman official was so upset that in retaliation, uh, they had Philip arrested and put to a cruel death. Thomas um, was probably the most active. He um, went to the east uh, area of Syria, or at least most active in the area east of Syria, I should say. Um, and he is believed, tradition holds, that he preached as far as India. So there's a particular rite in Catholicism called the Syro-Malabar rite. It's part of the Alexandrian family of Catholic rites uh, in India. So if you're a Catholic and you're in India, very likely you're either a Roman Catholic or you are a Syro-Malabar Catholic. And that tradition takes their lineage, traces it to St. Thomas himself coming and proclaiming the gospel there. Um, th those people um, in India claim that tradition, their tradition says that he died when he was pierced through um, by spears of four different soldiers who martyred him. After Thomas usually listed Matthew and Bartholomew, Matthew we know is the tax collector um, that he ministered, believe, was believed to have ministered in Persia and down to Ethiopia. Uh, and he is believed to be the founder of the Ethiopian Rite Church uh, in Africa. Um, and some reports say that he either wasn't martyred, but most agree that he was and that he was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Bartholomew um, is believed to have traveled to India with Thomas and then came back to Armenia, Ethiopia. He was in South Southern Arabia. All these different accounts um, end up ending that he was martyred in some way. He's typically depicted as he is in the Sistine Chapel ceiling, or not in the Sistine Chapel ceiling, in the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo as having been skinned alive, and he's actually holding his own skin in that image of that picture. Um, next is Simon the Zealot, or Simon the Cananean, uh, believed to be a part of the religious zealots uh, who wanted to overthrow Rome. It's believed that he went to Persia, ministered there, and he was killed after refusing to sacrifice to their sun god in Persia. And then uh, Matthias, the one who replaced Judas, is believed that he went to Syria with Andrew and was killed, martyred, by being burned alive. And so all of these, I think that's all of them, all of these apostles brought this faith, except for John, to their death. But they took this authority seriously, and we have a little window into what happens here. And these real historical people went to these real historical places and founded these real historical churches that still exist today. This is not a made-up fairy tale. This is an action stemming from specific authority and ability given to them by Jesus. And the same thing is true for you and me. We've been given specific authority by Jesus by virtue of our baptism and our confirmation to go out to the ends of the earth and to proclaim the good news. And one day people might trace their church or their relationship with God's lineage back to that conversation that they had with us. And that's not for our own glory. None of these apostles received immense amounts of glory and praise and accolades. No, they received a martyr's death because they knew what they were working for was not earthly treasure, but eternal life. That's why it says in the very last passage, very last verse, without cost you have received, without cost you are to give. This is not something for monetary gain. You know, the life of a missionary can be pretty lucrative. If you are a good speaker, you're very convincing, you're doing good work, people will give you money. And Jesus knew that. And there was probably people taking advantage of people left and right at the time. The apostles weren't about that. They were to offer everything, every healing, every word of praise, every proclamation of the gospel free of charge. And so those are the apostles who are sent. And then he says he sends these 12 after instructing them thus. He gives them specific instructions. Do not go into any pagan territory or Samaritan town. 
Uh, the actual translation of that is do not go the way of a pagan territory or a Samaritan town, meaning don't journey that way. Don't get distracted. Stay to going to the places where I am asking you to go first. And that is the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now that in one way means those Jewish Christians or those Jewish uh, believers who are part of the covenant of God, who Jesus came to be the Jewish Messiah, to fulfill these prophecies and to establish a new covenant to bring about the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. But it also has to do with those who are lost. You know, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Those who are ostracized, marginalized, set aside by society, those are the people that Jesus tends to interact with and care for the most. And he says, as you go, make this proclamation, not teach, make this proclamation, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven, excuse me, is at hand. Matthew tends to prefer the phrase the kingdom of heaven because the name of God is so sacred to Jewish people, and he was a faithful Jew, that he puts in the kingdom of heaven as a respectful substitute. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's all you have to know. That's all you have to say. That's all you have to memorize. And then show them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How? By the authority I have given you by curing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, and driving out demons, and do it without charging a thing. Invite them to come and see where this comes from. This is the model for all of us. Sometimes it's easy to talk and talk and talk and explain and defend the faith, but we forget that sometimes we just need to sit and listen to someone, to pray with them, to heal the wounds in their heart by just being empathetic, by being in conversation with them, by loving them, by building a relationship. Sometimes we forget to invoke the power of the Holy Spirit who can still raise the dead, cure leprosy, heal the sick. He can still do all of those things. And the church still has the authority, by virtue of the sacraments, to go and send out people to do that. Like, next time someone is sick, next time someone is in pain, next time something horrific happens, pray. Pray that the miraculous power of God will be present and will work a miracle. And have the expectant faith that you are expecting in advance that this is going to happen. And so praying for it is just an easy step, a way you're just opening the door. A lot of times I think when we pray for this stuff, we act like we have to say a certain formula or the right words so that God will hear us. And it has to be eloquent. It has to be perfect. It has to be the best situation possible. Everyone's emotions need to be elevated and then it will happen. No. Just ask, Lord, heal this person of their woundedness. Completely heal them of their cancer from head to toe and help them to know it was you. I ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Simple words. It doesn't need to be emotional, eloquent, highly theological. Use the power that you've been given, brothers and sisters, by virtue of the, your baptism of confirmation of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and the gifts and charisms you have as a result of that. Use them to go and build the kingdom of heaven. That, I believe, is what Jesus is asking of us because, brothers and sisters, whether you realize it or not, you are preaching a gospel every single day. You're either preaching a gospel, a good news that is of God, a good news that is earthly and that you think will take the place of God, or an anti-gospel. And I would say any good news that's presented as good news that's not the good news is an anti-gospel. You're presenting it whether you realize it every day in your words, your actions, your demeanor to others, the things that you prioritize, how you spend your time, how you spend your money. You are putting forth an example of this is what I think life is about. This is what I think will make me and others happy, so I am pursuing it. And if that doesn't lead people to the logical conclusion that, wow, that person's a believer, they're a person of prayer, they believe in God, powerful things are happening in that person's life, God is using that person. If they can't see that in some way, they may not be able to articulate it that clearly or that specifically, but if they don't have evidence of that, then what are we doing? What are we doing with this great gift of life that God has given us? The forgiveness of sins, what were they taken away for? We are just then empty vessels waiting to be filled up with something either good or bad. It doesn't really matter. It's not really clear if we don't have that purpose. We don't have that response or appreciation for what God has done for us. And so how are you responding to the calling God has placed on your heart? How are you using the gifts that he has given you? Because brothers and sisters, these apostles, they did it. Paul and Barnabas, who become numbered with the apostles, they went out and they went on several missionary journeys spreading the faith all throughout the Western world, the known world at that time. And because of the belief, the faith, and the tenacity of 12 men plus a few others who came along later, 
this small band of 12 people, 120 total disciples at the time of Jesus' ascension into heaven, became 2 billion Christians on earth, 1.3 billion Catholics in the world, all because of that faith. Now, what could you do? What is God inviting you to do with just a little bit of faith? How might the world change? Because you say yes, because you proclaim the gospel. You pray for healing. You pray for people to be free of darkness. And you allow that to happen for yourself first. How might the world be changed? Because brothers and sisters, I promise it will be. Whether you realize it or not, the power to change the course of the world and human history, that same power that did it in the 12 apostles, that power rests in you. Are you using it? Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, help us to proclaim the gospel in all that we say and do each and every day. Help us to take the authority that you have given us seriously. Help us to know that you are present with us. You are calling us to do something real. That you were intentional in everything that you did, intentional in selecting these apostles and sending them out to do specific things with specific instructions. So help us to take that same advice to recognize that teaching does have a place, but it comes after relationship, healing, miraculous invitations of your presence to be known and the people who do not know your power yet, Lord. And so I pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to notice the opportunities that you present before us in the coming week to evangelize others, to witness to the power of faith, and help us each day to ask, what gospel am I preaching? by my life, my words, my actions? And how can I more conform that gospel to the good news that you have come to die for our sins and that we can have eternal life with you if we repent, believe, are baptized, receive the Holy Spirit, and remain in a state of grace? We can receive that gift of eternal life. We pray all of these things, Lord Jesus, in your most precious name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.